Ladies and gentlemen, uh, welcome to today's lightning talk sessions. And we have still two free slots, so if you want to talk four minutes about the topics that might be interesting to this bunch, please fill the ethernet to its LinkedIn schedule. And first up, we have introduction to lightning talk. So what is it? How does it work? So we want to have many different topics shared. Uh, that might be interesting to everyone. We share this one laptop and we try to not do live presentations if we can avoid it, but if you must, then do it at your own risk. And the idea is uh, four minute slots with one minute for handover, so we can have uh, nine different topics, but maybe we have some shorter topics and then we can squeeze some more in. Otherwise, I will have a timer that will beep and then we switch speakers. And first up, we have on our list uh, Jan Engelhardt with quality risk rating of retro funds. And oh, your turn. Welcome. Hmm. <laughs> Hi, my name is Jan Engelhardt. Uh, today um, I'll be talking about uh, some rescaling for bitmap fonts. So, uh, if you know this uh, screenshot, it's 20, uh, it's been there for 20 years in our installer, and it's not all just about uh, nos the nostalgic look, but also there's some practical things to be said um, about these fonts, such as uh, thickness and so on. But that's a topic for another day. So. My goal was to get all the bitmap fonts uh, working in today's mostly graphical environments because we have left uh, text consoles almost behind us. Uh, they only survive in, for example, X term. And so, uh, if you try to use uh, bitmap fonts today, you will uh, notice a lot of roadblocks uh, along the way. Uh, they don't do upscaling and so on. Uh, so, so the conclusion is that uh, we need to convert everything to open type these days to, to make it work. Uh, we can look at, or rather I looked at, uh, using some existing tools. Uh, one of that uh, is the PO trace, which I think is also in Inkscape, and the results were not great if you try to vectorize your bitmap fonts this way. Uh, I tried the HQX and XBRZ scalers that have been popularized in uh, games and DOSBox, for example, which uh, produces quite an acceptable result, but uh, outputs you a bitmap once again that you then still need to convert into vector somehow. Uh, it stops at six times zoom, which I guess is enough for now, but uh, not in the long run. And you can also see that uh, some of the stems in, in the glyphs are getting quite bulgy, as in the F. And so what I set out to do is to just do the vectorization myself, that is, uh, write something not invented here. Um, there's a bit of uh, algorithmic other, um, so you take the bitmap, uh, turn those in, into edges and do something with it. You end up uh, with a usable font this way. Um, so I have, a, I have a tool which is called uh, the VGA font assembler originally, and it can output uh, SFD, which is FontForge's native output, fo output format, and you then can convert it to other formats such as OpenType, PFB, and whatever else it offers, including back to bitmaps. Um, we still have the problem of um, addressing the, the staircase pattern, the jagged edges of bitmap fonts, and there, there was one font uploaded sometime in 2009 called Nouveau IBM, which uh, provided uh, an inspiration of uh, how to improve the, the look of low-resolution fonts, which is to just uh, make diagonals out of that. Uh, you, you can, we can also try uh, replacing them with curved splines instead, and then you get something like a classic Mac OS look on your font. Um, uh, staircases can you, you, we can look for the staircases uh, either by uh, with bitmap windows, uh, but then I notice I'm running into the same problem as XBRZ uh, in that I'm getting truncated stems and mm, not such a great look. But uh, the code is still there, and one can also still exercise it for fun. But I've gone to look at the outline edges instead. 
and then modify those uh, if I find a staircase pattern. Uh, for example, a staircase pattern in this case is then when the direction of the edges changes in a particular way. And <laughs> there are a few uh, problem points in this still left. For example, uh, in the isthmus point in a G, do you connect it or do you not connect it? In the one and a half glyph, uh, there are isthmuses in the, in the two part or near the slash, and so I've opted to not connect it. Uh, next slot. Uh, time is up. Ten. Oh, <laughs> good. Thanks for your attention. Uh, font packs have been uploaded to, to a URL, and that's my time here. <laughs> okay, Adam. <laughs> your turn. Uh, get. I have my own timer so you don't cheat. Okay. Okay, so my name is. My name is Adam Meyer. I work at SUSE, and today I would like to talk to you about, or you can just press F. Okay, maybe not. I will talk to you about a very short story, very lightning story about Git and SHA-256. So why are you talking about this SHA-256 and, and anything in general? So anyway, OBS and Git, uh, this is kind of this thing that we want to have merged for last 20 years or 10 years or however long Git existed, because we don't like Git, uh, I mean o OBS. OBS is good for building, but the other thing is good for better at version control. Um, and we've decided, I guess, in some way that uh, there would be a nice challenge for us to have Git as a source control for ALP. So no more packages in OBS, but packages in, in, in uh, Git. But can we do better than just pure Git? And yes, it would be nice if we could sign these repositories. For example, if you can check out factory and this is signed by some keys and you can ver verify later that, okay, this is, this is actually the real uh, sources for factory. But wait, there's a problem. So this is a very simple uh, git commit with a highlighted signature. And can anyone see a problem? Yeah? There's the problem. The tree is SHA-1. So, and it's actually SHA-1 all the way down. It's like turtles, but it's SHA. So SHA-1 all the way down. And why is it a problem? When you sign a SHA-1 hash, you're basically just trusting this SHA-1 as your base security level. So if, you sign, if your signature is SHA-256, 512, doesn't matter, your SHA-1 is what you're trusting. So, can we improve this? And for a number of years already, Git has introduced this object format with SHA-256. So everything in Git is now SHA-256 all the way down. Uh, problems again. Um, there is no interrupt with SHA-1 repositories. This is planned but not yet implemented. So upstream implemented all the SHA-256 in Git tools, but SHA-1 interrupt, okay, it's waiting for patches and motivation, I guess. And I guess there's no such motivation because if you go to GitHub, GitLab, Pagger, anything, you try to import your SHA-256 in their repository, it will, until last month, GitLab would give you error 500 and it would DOS your account. Um, GitHub, I didn't try to lock myself out. Pagger will give you blank page. Gitty gave you an also blank page, but, over the last few months, we've been a little bit busy, and now we have a Gitty patched with a work in progress upstream patch that has this working. So you can go to gitty.openstore.org, log in with your OBS password, and make SHA-256 repositories there, or SHA-1, and it should work transparently for you. So now you have this thing that works, that looks the same, but you have a tree that is SHA-256. And since it's a lightning talk, I even have a demo. Uh, let's see, let's click here. A few seconds. Uh, where's the uh, full page? A tip. Which one? Tip. Touch bit. Ah, okay. So this is, uh, this is our SHA-256 repository. If you mouse over it, on the bottom, I guess, you see your SHA-256 uh, hash instead of SHA-1, and you click on there, or? Tip. Oh, tap on the, okay. 
and it loads and everything should work and yeah you don't you don't you should not see any difference so if you have any questions afterwards in the lunch you can come and talk to me and if you have any problems with this work in progress yeah also please get in touch with me and yeah start testing yeah <laughs> Okay, next up we have Christian with Upper Modi. It's PDF. Here. So, I, I want to talk about the Upper Modi D project, which is, let's say, testing its, its my current playground. And maybe you know that six, 640 kilobytes are enough for everybody but 640 upper more profiles are not enough for everybody. And therefore, Alexandre thought, ah, let's create 1,150 profiles, so for lots of programs. And I checked on my laptop yesterday, so I had 145 processes with profiles applied, and only 55 without, and well, not counting the kernel processes. So, these profiles are not finished yet, so work in progress, especially in the area of KDE, because they are quite new. So I still get audit log entries, but things improve. So, and if you want to test yourself, then one option is to get the profiles from the upstream GitHub repo, and the other option is to take the package from my home repo. And one note, these profiles are packaged in complain mode, so they will not actually block anything, but only create log entries. And I hope that I can switch to enforce mode one day, but probably not in the next four weeks. So that's that one. And as a little bonus, I also looked at Abamoa in Alp or Grossignol. And, well, actually it's quite easy. If you choose edit in the bootloader, then you will see security as eLinux and as eLinux one. And if you just change that to Abamoa, then you are done. Uh, well, more or less. Because the Alp repo only has libabamoa and abamoa parser published. And the profiles and the user space tools for updating the profiles are not part of the Alp repo, hmm, well, maybe yet. So, let's see. And yeah, that's it from me, and have a lot of fun with Abamoa. <laughs> it's even one minute left. <laughs> That's a good one. It's even next up our more profiles. So I think Florian is in another room. So we will skip him and maybe Adam does the next one. Why I had OC. So you, you don't you should not read this why I hate OSC. And yes, uh, oh, it's fine. Um, I'm still Adam Meyer, and I still hopefully work at SUSE. <laughs> so, why I hate OSC, this is not about OpenSUSE conference, this is about a tool. And you have to read this with the colon. So it's colon, colon, why, colon, I, colon, hate, OSC, colon, <laughs> yeah, you, you get the drift. And this is by colon, colon, by design, yeah? And we tend to blame OBS for this. Oh, I hate OBS because this project separator, right? You go to some project, you check it out with the columns. Then you go to this package, and you run something in there, and uh, you try to work with this unpacked sources, and then you go make test, and then you end up with file not found error. And it's like, what the heck is going on? I can see the file, why I can see it? Like this, this is a make file, for example, can't see it or something like this. And then you'll think for a while, and then you'll think, oh, the environment doesn't work with these columns in there because the path, you cannot escape this column, it's, it's hard-coded. You cannot escape it in the library path. 
it's hard coded yeah it's it's stuck you so if if any test any program inside this unpacked repository relies on on environment variables it you're you're stuck you have to copy it to some other place um thanks OSC yeah but don't worry, you can elevate your programming work to become a rock star 10 times programmer if you just use rockets. Because if you use rockets, they work with the environment. You don't have to escape anything. Yeah, the path works if you have rockets. And this feature is already in OSC and factory. So you have a project separator. You can put uh, any UTF here. You can, uh, it's a string, so you can use a, you use a rocket. You can use a Bitcoin emoji if you're a fan of that. Or uh, you can uh, find a, a colon in UTF that is not the uh, ASCII color, but, uh, but uh, a UTF colon, so you can think it's the same. You may say, oh, Adam, this is a problem because I can't type a rocket emoji. But you can use a tab and it will auto-complete for you. So you can also still paste with a colon and it will still work. So even if you have to use a separate, uh, different project separator, you can continue to use columns for your OSC command and it will just substitute them back and forth when going to the um, um, OBS. So if you find any problems, uh, yeah, send me an email and I will try to fix it because I've been using this already for a number of months. It's really improved, uh, improved my ability to run things inside these checked out uh, packages. So you can thank OSC that it's now working properly with rocket emojis. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> thank you. And next up is one of mine. Uh, my fallback ones, uh, because uh, you guys didn't add enough lightning talks, too bad, uh, so now you need to uh, get my... Hmm? Uh, <laughs> yeah. um, anyway, let's do a quick one about our OpenSUSE infrastructure for the download, and we have this nice Etherpad here. Uh, no, not Etherpad, ah. What did I do? Ah. Okay, so our download infrastructure, download opens the org, many people know it. Uh, has seen some growth in the last three years from 200k users to somewhere in a range of 700k users. So we are getting quite some load and that load is not even uh, even out, but we have spikes in traffic. Uh, every day we get a new Tumbleweed release and then we get a spike for the async transfers to other mirrors. And uh, sometimes we get a big uh, new uh, full rebuild and that's uh, several gigabytes uh, that first goes to uh, the main server and then it gets synced out. Then uh, we have leap updates and they have um, big metadata files and everyone pulls them uh, immediately because there are scripts that uh, recheck uh, regularly. And then we got spikes and for that we already got an extra machine called download content 2 that uh, handles these spikes so they don't hit the main server anymore. And they can be quite big, like a gigabit uh, for several minutes. Then we have short spikes because uh, some companies have hundreds of machines and they run their salt super ref over all of the machines at the same time. So you get some load spikes uh, for some seconds there. And overall, uh, we are working on improving that infrastructure. There will be a session later today at 14 o'clock in uh, the seminar room upstairs. And there we have a closer look uh, onto these things and why uh, GeoIP uh, requests are the greatest thing since uh, sliced bread. And how it helps. Uh, with uh, future improvements, because 
as you can see, uh, when you have the default experience of download OpenSUSE.org, you go uh, to the Nuremberg machine, get a redirect to a mirror, and then uh, you fetch the file from mirrors, and sometimes even in small chunks from different mirrors, which doesn't help. Uh, so if you go to a mirror, you can be five times faster sometimes, and we want to improve that. And how exactly will be discussed later. So that is uh, the quick run uh, about afternoon session. And that will be more detailed. <laughs> okay. Thanks. So still no more people presenting. Come on. We still have um, a quarter an hour, so you can get four minutes of speaking about a topic you like. And if you don't, then comes the next. And the next is a quick primer on reproducible builds, which is a topic I have been working on for quite a long time. Since 2016, and what is it? Uh, you have people who want to know where the stuff comes from. Uh, why does it matter? Yeah, you have these producers of stuff, and not just for eggs, but also for software. And uh, these uh, want to deliver the software over Git tables and packages over the mirrors to the users. And most of these uh, errors we can secure with uh, digital uh, signatures, mostly GPG, except for the build part where we transform sources from uh, to binaries. And uh, in principle, uh, someone could ha hack a build machine, manipulate it, and get a backdoor binary in there, and get that published and signed to users, and that would not be nice. So what do we do? We do reproducible builds, and we build packages twice, get uh, bit by bit identical results, and that's not even as hard as some people think. And in OBS, we sometimes also apply filters to strip off some stuff that's not really important, but it's not true reproducible builds, so we want this bit by bit identical ones. And then we can take inputs and do two builds and get identical binaries out, and that's what we want. And we can do even that three times, five times, ten times. Doesn't matter because it's always the same binary anytime, anywhere. And why? So one is a trust, but we can also reduce load in the build service because we don't need to rebuild depending packages when uh, something didn't change really. Uh, for our leap updates, we produce delta RPMs, they can be smaller, so we save bandwidth, and we even find uh, bugs in the process. There's some fun bugs, like a package that produced a different result uh, when it was full moon. Uh, <laughs> that's uh, a story I can't uh, <laughs> think of. I think it was a Hello World package that is some profile-guided optimizations. And so why is it? Yeah, because people uh, put timestamps and host name in there, and the funny thing is that if you can produce the same binary anytime, anywhere, you don't need a timestamp and a host name when a binary was produced. So it's somehow paradoxical. And yeah, optimization, uh, we get all people compile with MArch native and put in invalid machine codes that wouldn't run on older CPUs, that's even a bug. And other things, uh, Python is especially bad because if you say, I want all C files, you get it in random order. That's not fun. And Python upstream said, yeah, we want this 4% extra performance of not sorting. So they don't. And I submitted a lot of uh, patches in the last years. I think it's over 1,000 meanwhile. So, and we have uh, tools to check for reproducibility, and we have slides for this presentation. So that's a formal summary uh, of the topic. If you want to do more, 
no more than you can talk to me. That is it. And we still have time. And someone who wants to talk for four minutes. Yes, Florian. You made it. Boxes PY. We have boxes PY here. Full screen. And my time is up. So I would just want everyone to be aware of the joy of laser cutting. Uh, for those who have seen 3D printers, they are great, but they are slow and imprecise, and lasers are fast and precise. So you can do stuff like this box in like uh, two minutes. Yeah, well, get just closer. Better? Better now? Yeah. And um, to make this easier, I have this small project of mine, which is basically just turtle graphics uh, gone too far. And there's no mouse. Ah, there's. It does come with a nice. Oh God, I can't move with this thing. A tip, tip for a click. Ah, this is cruel. It doesn't. Uh, two, two fingers go. Yeah. I'm deeply in this. Uh, uh, other mouse thing. Tip. <laughs> Tip on the touchpad. Okay. So it has a nice web interface if you want to do something. We just added this gallery, which is the. Which I'm still fighting. So it has about a hundred different types of boxes and uh, not so much box slides objects. Hey, it works. I totally forgot to bring some because I'm unprepared and I'm no longer uh, in, in this whole com uh, conference business for a few years. So there are a couple of uh, nice boxes. There are less boxes and there are inserts for stuff like board games and tools and spices and wine bottles and tools and random assorted stuff. There's a small robot we have, and uh, even more boxes. So it's in Python, there's a nice interface, you can do your own, or just uh, go on one of those. They do have a whole set of uh, settings. Um, you can Select the material thickness. You can select the uh, source of your uh, the curve of your laser cutter. There's settings for all the different types of edges and flex and stuff. There, if you are if you can fly a uh, 747, you will be will be just at home with all the settings. So that's basically it. Have fun. Yeah, thank you very much. That sounds cool. you find online uh, uh, guides uh, where you have uh, Ubuntu or Debian style uh, installation instructions. And if you just copy and paste them into OpenSUSE, it can work because we have a, a super aptitude package. And it will even map package names, except we drop Python 2 and now it's named differently, so we need to uh, update the mappings uh, properly. And uh, once uh, we do that update of the mappings, 
then it will map Debian package names to the proper open to the package names, and you can just uh, copy paste uh, Debian instructions into your open source, and uh, it will work there, as you can see. Another nice tool is MTR, which works a bit like ping and trace route, uh, but it uh, can repeat and collect statistics about best and worst, and the standard deviation can give a nice idea of uh, where your network is overloaded, and you can see a packet loss uh, there that can also be an indicator of where your network is bad. So that's a really cool tool for network debugging. And then we have um, access control lists that come in handy when you have uh, secret files uh, that need to be readable by two or three or four different entities. For example, your web server here. And then you can see now the web server has read access to this one file. Many people don't know about access control lists. So that comes in handy. And then we have another come What's next? It's change ultra. We can uh, set files to immutable uh, so that no other program accidentally modifies it. And you can list it with ls atre and remove it again with change atre minus e. And another tool for debugging, performance issues especially, that's uh, VM start. It will show memory usage, uh, swap in out, block in out, interrupts context changes, uh, CPU idle, and these things. So that's a really nice overview of what happens, and it even writes this history in your shell. Unlike top. And then we have one last, uh, which is uh, S-trace and L-trace. That can show you uh, what files are accessed uh, by any program. And not just files, it can also show you network accesses or uh, other syscalls. For example, you can write a exec VE in there and see what programs are executed uh, by that. And so there's L trace that does it on a library level. So you can see what library calls are used there, but that only works with uh, dynamically linked programs, not with statically linked, like Go or Rust. So that's. Uh, all of it. Questions? So otherwise, no more lighting talks. That was it. We're done. Welcome. <laughs> oh. <laughs>